Washington Grown is brought to you by the Potato Farmers of Washington. Learn why Washington is home to the world's most productive potato fields and farmers by visiting potatoes.com. Also brought to you by Northwest Farm Credit Services, supporting agriculture and rural communities with reliable, consistent credit and financial services today and tomorrow. And by the Washington Turfgrass Seed Commission, helping our farmers produce the highest quality turfgrass seed in the world. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Gorenson and welcome to Washington Grown. Mom always told you to eat your vegetables, right? And with good reason, they're good for us and they're tasty, especially when they're prepared just right. In this episode, we're gonna see the care that goes into growing Washington vegetables and we're gonna get a lesson on how to cook them. Tomas is visiting a small family-run vegetable farm in Spokane Valley. This is what a lot of farms would look like just a generation ago. And I'll make mushroom stroganoff at Gilded Unicorn. This is bringing back so many memories. <laughs> My mom would be very proud. <laughs> Plus, Tomas is helping out at Share Farm, giving food to those affected by the coronavirus pandemic. Those microgreens were given out with love. All this and more today on Washington Grown. It looks. It's a little baby pig. <laughs> That's really, really good. Wait. <laughs> That's a little party in a little glass. Well, hello there. Gobble, 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 gobble. Oh! No TV bites here. I'm going to dig in. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Today we're at one of Spokane's hidden gems, Gilded Unicorn. The stylish restaurant is serving up some old classics in new, fresh ways. This is a super cool space. So I think this is one of the great, unique spaces in Spokane. Local restaurateur Adam Hegstad owns Gilded Unicorn alongside a few other high-end Spokane restaurants. To him, Gilded Unicorn's charm can be found in its rich history. This is one of the oldest hotels in Spokane, um, and this used to be the boiler room of the hotel. Well, I love the atmosphere. Very warm atmosphere, I love the brick. Kind of just like a place to chill. I like coming down and kind of being into a spot that you didn't even know. Yeah, here. like nobody like you else have to knows be in about the inn. Like the inn, yeah. It's like a secret inn. club. Almost like a castle medieval feel to it as well. It's a little bit quirky. We like to not take ourselves too seriously and we want people to come in here and feel very comfortable. Be able to have a place where you can have a little bit of fun, get some food that's like very approachable and stuff that you recognize, uh, but then it's done like a little bit higher quality, fresher ingredients. Adam likes to cook to the season, catering every dish around local foods and the time of year. You're not gonna get the same exact experience every time because we don't want it to be that way. We want it to be a little bit surprised. We have our favorite items that don't that don't change. When we have a new menu sort of coming out every three or four weeks, if you want to come in every three or four weeks, you're going to see brand new menu items, but you'll still have your favorites on there too. I got the deviled eggs. Probably the bacon wrapped dates. Had an appetizer, drink, and got ordered more. So it was really good the first round. We've almost ordered everything on the appetizer list. Coming up later in the show, Adam and I will be making some mushroom stroganoff. Mm, that's really good. <laughs> if I do Not to say be so my myself. <laughs> Today I'm in Spokane Valley visiting New Heritage Farms. We visit many types and sizes of farms here in Washington, from family farms with hundreds of acres to small farms like this one. Look at that. Oh, perfect. That's a nice looking one. Farmers Ben and Rhea Alexander are proving that big things can come in small packages. If you just drew a straight line, I'd say that this is about three quarters of an acre. And an actual vegetable production, we have one half of an acre tied up in bed space. We're located near the intersection of Sprague and Argonne. That intersection is right smack dab in the middle of suburbia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you gotta understand we're three blocks uh, from uh, the city hall of Spokane Valley. And this is a little bit of a more untraditional setting, but if you go back in time, this is actually very traditional. This is what a lot of farms would look like just a generation ago. New Heritage Farm is a diversified vegetable farm, meaning they grow all sorts of things. Uh, we got peppers, eggplants, cherry tomato, two more rows of heirloom tomatoes, cabbage, kale, collard greens. Well, you get the idea. Currently, they supply a few restaurants, a farmer's market, and their CSA program. 
So a CSA works by individuals in our community um, investing in us at the beginning of the season. Spring is when the expenses are the highest, so they help with those. And then in exchange for that investment, we'll be providing them vegetables from May all the way to mid-October. This is amazing. This is a snow structure. This cathedral caterpillar tunnel is designed to be able to take a snow load, so you're able okay. to grow four seasons in here. We decided if we go greens in here, not only is it shady during the summer months, but we're gonna be able to pitch uh, snow in the winter months to where we can continue cultivating the space for four seasons. I'm looking at this area of land here and I feel like you are just using every single piece of land for some purpose. This has gotta be a lot of work. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work. As a farmer, you're kind of like the orchestrator between marketing and accounting and growing and packing and distributing. Like, you just have to have all your hands in these different areas. It keeps you busy. You know, we see the value in having a close connection with our food. We feel that as a society and culture, we've lost that connection because to be quite honest with you, it's only been in the last generation or two that we don't have a family member who's a farmer. People just don't know where their food comes from and what it took for them to have that food. Why do you like being a farmer? This keeps me grounded. You develop a deeper understanding of what it means to be a human. Because I mean, you know, we are what we eat. This is the way that I want to live and this is the lifestyle that I feel we as humans were meant to live. Hey, let's go. All of us should be eating more fresh, local veggies. And today, we're gonna see how one Spokane food truck is making it that much easier. My name's Tony Epifanio, and this is Mixed Plate Food Truck. Tony's wife, Nat, is the chef for Mixed Plate, and her Thai heritage definitely put a stamp on the menu. I started the food business 10 years ago with a hot dog cart. That's how we met. I was doing what I did and then found out how much he should cook, and we rolled that into what this is and what we've done. Tony and Nat care about fresh food, and they feel that keeping things local is the way to go. If you can support local and, and you can actually, just like us, when you come eat at our food truck, you're talking to me, you can say hi to Nat, so you get to know the people. So it's, it's awesome to be able to grow your local area and help local and, and uh, you know, support each other. Now it's time to try Mixed Plate's fresh food for myself. When you get fresh veggies, a delicious flavor, mixing that with good, awesome chicken, you can't go wrong. Now let's see if everybody likes this as much as I do. So tell me, do you like your vegetables? Oh, I love my vegetables. I like some vegetables, yeah. When they're mixed with other stuff that make them taste better, it's pretty <laughs> easy. I like broccoli, cucumber. Sweet peas, green beans. Tomatoes, lettuce, carrots. Squash, asparagus. I could always I could use more. I think we all could use a little more veggies. Right. Why don't you give that a shot? It actually reminds me of home. The texture and the fresh vegetables kind of like changed the whole food itself. It's heavenly. A little bit of like heat kicking in now. The veggies, they're just really fresh and the dressing adds to them. They make them really, really good, almost better than the meat, which is still stellar. I love food, what can I say? <laughs> if you need kids to eat the vegetables, this is the way to do it. So this is a dish you'd recommend highly to some friends. Oh yeah. <laughs> in fact, I want to try and figure out how I can copycat it at home. <laughs> right after this, I'm getting back in line. Coming up, I'm at Gilded Unicorn making mushroom stroganoff with Adam Hegstead. Mm, that's really good. <laughs> if I do Not say to be so my myself. <laughs> and we're in the kitchen at Second Harvest trying out some blueberry zucchini bread. a gilded unicorn, the iconic Spokane eatery hidden right beneath your feet. It's like a secret club. Almost like a castle medieval feel to it as well. It kind of feels like a little secret spot that you found. When you are walking from the street, it doesn't, you know, sort of unassuming. And then you walk into this sort of nice, cool cave, funky art all over the walls. And then when the food and the drinks come in, you can see the quality of products that you're getting. The atmosphere. Uh, the food, the drinks, I would definitely bring guys here to hang out. I actually have brought many friends here. I'm like, hey, you want to go out for apps? They're like, yes. I'm like, let's go to the Gilded Unicorn. 
I think that's part of the joy of having restaurants is being able to have a creative outlet. Taking those same ideas and like kind of putting a little bit of a twist on them, putting our uh, vision and direction into that, it's it's turned out into a great restaurant. Yeah. Well, I love the atmosphere. Very chill. Not very high pace. You can just have your conversations and just enjoy your company. Now it's off to the kitchen to make some mushroom stroganoff. So the chanterelles and trumpet mushrooms are a uh, wild mushroom that grows around here locally. Uh, these ones were dried and rehydrated, and the water I use for rehydrating those is right here. And so oh, this okay. is what we're going to use to make the sauce base. Yeah. And this is a really great umami sort of flavor to it, a mouth watering sensation. Go ahead and take about a uh, half inch off the top there, and then just do a little bit of cross hatching on the, on the top, like a giant hashtag. <laughs> I left a lot of the material here a little bit um, bigger chunks because I like the sauce to be pretty meaty. Yeah. Since we don't have actual you know, beef in there, it's good to have like a, some bigger pieces in there. Absolutely. First, we fry the mushroom in some oil and season the bottom with salt. As you can see, it kind of browns up. It, lo it really does look like a piece of chicken or something yeah, like totally. that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So this is a stroganoff, mm -hmm. which is sort of like a throwback kind of oh, dish, yeah. right? Yeah. Like I remember my mom yes, exactly. making stroganoff. Yeah, and so that's really what we're about here. Taking those same ideas and then making them a little bit more modern and bring them up to date and then adding fresh ingredients. I'm gonna go ahead and save our mushroom oil here because that's great flavor. Because why not? I don't, don't right? wanna waste it. <laughs> no. Next, we add some rough chopped onion into a pot and cook it until it's translucent. It's always the seasonality of the products that helps guide our menu. That's, yeah. that's our starting place always. We have a partnership with um, Share Farm, which really does a great job of working with local farmers. We start at the seasonal place. So we look at that list of ingredients and then we'll create our, our menu yeah. off of that. After the onions have browned up a little, we add in roasted garlic and some flour to thicken the sauce. Next, we add some mushroom pieces for flavor. And then this is the liquid I had from rehydrating mushrooms. It has a little bit of Bragg's amino in it. We use it a lot in vegetarian cooking because it adds a depth and a little bit of wholesomeness and yeah. kind of a roundness yeah. to it. Each time I add liquid, I just let it thicken all the way up. With this method, it basically ensures that it's not gonna separate. After our sauce is thickened to the consistency we want, Adam adds some rough chopped parsley, black pepper, salt, and finally the cream. The reason I add the cream last, I don't want to make this a really too heavy of a sauce, but I just really want to finish it and lighten it up with the cream, and so I'm not going to add as much. And I just add a touch of it to add maybe a, a little bit of richness to it, but not cloying. Now we let the sauce cook until it's the consistency we want. This is bringing back so many memories. <laughs> so we'll just grab a little bit of this pasta. My mom would be very proud. <laughs> While Adam gets the noodles ready, I slice our big mushroom up like a piece of chicken. Next, we put the mushroom on the dish and top it all off with some sour cream. Now that's a hearty meal. That's a hearty meal right there. <laughs> let's give it a try. Yeah, let's do it. Mm, that's really good. <laughs> okay, I think not to be so my myself. Own. <laughs> really good mushroom flavor, yeah. but it's not overwhelmingly rich or anything Yeah, it's like not, that. I mean, that's, and that's kind of what we're shooting for. We really shoot for something that's like not so heavy. And I like the different textures of the mm -hmm. mushrooms too. To get the recipe for Gilded Unicorn's Mushroom Stroganoff, visit wagrown.com. Now we're headed to Orting to visit the green man himself, Mac McLaughlin. He's well known in Seattle and Tacoma for his delicious microgreens, but he didn't start out that way. 2008, I'd lost my job as a furniture maker and I was trying to sell greenhouses. So I wasn't selling any of those and I found a book that said growing microgreens for the restaurant trade. And I looked and I said, I've already got the greenhouse, I can do that. Now you're Mac the Green Man. Yeah, I started in May. By the end of that year, this was completely full. I was making $500 a week off of a 10 by 10 greenhouse. Since then, he's upgraded his operation. During the latter part of the summer last year, every single shelf in here was completely full of microgreens all the time. And it's just you. Yeah, I'm just a one man dog and pony <laughs> show. So this is my garden area. Well, you have a green and thumb for sure. What's the difference between growing microgreens and then the sprouted greens? Is there a difference? The reason they're called microgreens is just a matter of how old they are. You have sprouts. You know, you put them in a jar and, and you rinse them two or three times a day mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll germinate and that's a sprout. Okay. If they're growing in the soil, the root goes into the soil and it comes up and it gets the first set of leaves and those are microgreens. And then it grows up and it gets a second set of leaves on it. And then those are baby greens. Just a matter of how old they are. 
interesting. Mac took me into the greenhouse to try some of his microgreens. But the chefs just love this. Chefs want color, texture, and taste. I've got texture, I've got color, I've got taste. You do, and it's just so beautiful. So I took him to one chef, he tasted all of this stuff, and he said, I've been in this business 30 years. And he says, and I use microgreens, I have used them for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I didn't know that they tasted like that. You have the magic touch. The thing is, I grow things that the other guys don't grow, so I can bring the chef things that nobody else has. Do you have a certain way that you like to eat them? Actually, <laughs> uh, I'm not really in the greens. Why do you think that the microgreens are important to Washington restaurant industry. Seattle and Tacoma in particular have a, a name as a high-end restaurant type of thing. It makes dining at a place like that an experience rather than just a meal. They want things that are special and microgreens are special. Coming up, Tomas is helping out at Share Farm, giving food to those affected by the coronavirus pandemic. Those microgreens were given out with love. Today we're at my home garden and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about raised beds. Raised beds are really popular for home gardeners and there's a lot of reasons why. The benefit of growing in a raised bed is that you have control over the soil that you're planting into. When you build your raised bed, you purchase the soil that goes inside and you can get a blend that's made just for you. This way your compost is already mixed in, your sand, and you can eliminate any weed seeds that you might be getting if you just dug dirt up from your yard and put it into the bed. When you build your raised bed, make sure that it's deep enough to provide room for the roots to grow down, especially if you're gonna be planting root crops like carrots or beets. Now, I like to use hoops over the tops of my raised beds to control the environment of my plants. So I use the hoops to put row cover on in the springtime to provide some frost protection. But I also use these hoops to put greenhouse plastic over the top when it's warm out for hot loving crops like peppers and eggplant. When you're building your raised bed, make sure that you build it to your size. So I like to make sure that in my raised bed, I can always reach the center from any side. This means that when you're weeding, it's less hard on your back, and it means it's more likely that if there's things growing in the center of your bed, that you'll harvest them. One of the things that I like to do is after I've cleared out everything that I'm growing for the summer months, I do a replant of carrots. You can harvest those carrots all year, even in the winter months. In fact, they get sweeter. Today, I'm at Eat Good Cafe in Liberty Lake. Here, boxes are being packed full of fresh local food by a company called Share Farm. So we source products out of the Pacific Northwest region and then use an online marketplace to create an access to those products to local consumers. Vincent Peake founded Share Farm alongside popular chef Adam Hegstead. They and their team run Share Farm kind of like Amazon. Customers can use the app to have food delivered right from a local Washington farm. Local food shouldn't be a problem to access. It's not a luxury. We think everyone should have access to local food and so that's really what gives us gratification doing what we're doing is creating access to that food, transparency in the food chain. In addition to Share Farm's usual operation, they're also reaching out to help their community. Using a USDA grant under the Farmers to Families Food Box program, they're packing boxes full of fresh Washington food to give to families impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. We're taking the regional products, sourcing them here at our location, same day delivery from the farm, pick the day before, and then delivering those goods directly to the consumer's address. With us, we've kind of leveraged some partnerships using um, Spokane Food Fighters to get that food directly to people's homes. My name is Marcus Riccelli. I'm the founder of Spokane Food Fighters. Spokane Food Fighters is a volunteer organization that delivers food to those in need. And when the recent pandemic left many families in need of food assistance, Spokane Food Fighters was born. We had hosts of newly food insecure people because they were unemployed and we wanted to do something about it. We believe that food is health and in a public health crisis, food shouldn't be forgotten. And so we knew a lot of people were struggling. I mean, we're delivering them artisan products, handmade, handcrafted goods. They're ecstatic to have this, you know, gift, essentially, um, that's supplied to them. So they're, they're really happy to get it. In addition to helping the community, the program also helps local farmers. 
for the farmer, we're giving that benefit of buying their entire crop every single week. So they don't have to worry about where it's going. We're taking that crop, buying all of it, delivering it direct to the consumer. When COVID happened, we wanted to do something to give back to the community. Robbie Catherine Anthony helped develop the Spokane Food Fighters. She's also the chief technology officer for Share Farm. We figured we could maybe create something that could actually address the current moment. And then I just fell in love with it, you know, to be able to give people food, it's such a necessity. Well, I couldn't let everybody around me do all the work, so it was time to do my part and get to packing boxes. Tomas is on microgreens. Look out. Those microgreens were given out with love. Once we've completed packing up the food, the Spokane Food Fighters put as many boxes as they can into their vehicles and deliver that food directly to the homes of those who need it. They'll take maybe an hour and a half to move 450 boxes out of here, and maybe within an hour, those boxes are delivered. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty Fantastic. fresh. <laughs> There's no incentive for them besides the gratification that they're doing good. It's emotional uh, when you hear from people who talk about uh, their desperation and how this is getting them by. You talk about the, a woman who shared with us that she's unplugged all of her appliances except for her microwave because she has to keep her electrical bills down. People who can't get out uh, because their children are at risk. You know, I get a lot of satisfaction out of solving a problem and food's really relational to all of us. It's, it's foundational, everyone needs food. I think this model is here to stay, creating a truly farm to table. We've talked about that, that's been a buzzword for a long time, but uh, this partnership, especially between Share Farm and Spokane Food Fighters, is evidence that that's no longer empty words. Hi everyone and welcome to In the Kitchen here at Second Harvest and this is our chance where we get to taste some recipes from allrecipes.com and I have my fellow taste testers here with me, my partners in crime. We have Tomas, my co-host. How you doing? I'm doing <laughs> And we have Laurent over here. He is a restaurant owner and chef of Fleur de Sel. Thank you for being here. It's good to see you, Christy. Yes, good to see you, to Thomas. See you. Today, we're talking about uh, vegetables. This is a vegetable episode, and we're talking about blueberry zucchini bread. Mm -hmm. Nice. Sounds good. Yum. <laughs> I think the blueberries are bringing a little bit of a zazz to it. I kind of like yeah, it. I I'm, like that. I'm excited to try it. You're yes, right. Yes, me too. And of course, you know, our small farmers of Washington State, they are producing, you know, a lot of great food for us and uh, blueberries and you name it, uh, they're growing it. And you got a chance, Tomas, right, to hang yeah. out with? Uh, ben and Rhea. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, you saw it yourself. We have no excuse to do anything with our yards when you see the amount of produce that they're producing in that little parcel of land. I mean, I need to get planning. <laughs> So today we're going to make blueberry zucchini bread, and this is by Laura. And again, these are from allrecipes.com. And Laura says, blueberries and zucchini baked up into a delicious summertime bread loaves. That sounds pretty good. All right, I'll right. take it. I'll take it. Ooh, cannot wait. Cannot <laughs> right, wait to try so it. Let's take a look at how we make it. Here we go. We get to try All this right. beautiful Ooh, blueberry can't. zucchini bread by Laura. This oh, looks good. Oh, you it's know, very right? moist. Look at that. I like that. It's I love the tartness of the blueberries. I do too. And I think you can also do that um, recipe all year round. And right. depending on your uh, availability, if you don't have blueberries, you can put cherries, fresh cherries, raspberries. Ooh. You know, that's uh, a good idea. 
Yeah. And Even if you wanted to try frozen blueberries, if you needed to over the winter, I, mean, mm -hmm. I could eat yeah. this anywhere. And the the cinnamon is very good in there. So mm -hmm. al almost can add some apples also or pears. Cranberries. Oh, Cranberries. Yeah. 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 Look at you guys coming up That's with those good. great ideas. <laughs> you just get us going. I'm just sitting yeah. here eating. <laughs> oh. It's delicious. So we have some comments uh, from some people on allrecipes.com. Amy and Brand say 100% kid approved <laughs> oh, completely. and mom approved yeah. and then Pam says uh, I made this as muffins which is a great oh, idea yeah, great um, idea. baked for 18 minutes at 375 she says that they're awesome and she will definitely make them again I like the That's idea great. of muffins it's beautiful it's great and and also uh, you know thanks to all the small farmers uh, as a restaurant owner uh, they are essential and key to uh, to great ingredients for a restaurant I think it's fantastic to have more and more small farms. And uh, in Spokane, uh, we have a great uh, uh, kind of a, a relay uh, from uh, Link Food uh, who, who gathers products from small producers and, and delivers to restaurants. So shout out to, to Link yeah, Food. Yeah, we love our small farmers, definitely. It's delicious. Yeah, so 100% approved by Tomas Christian oh. Laurent. <laughs> It's gone already. <laughs> <laughs> to get the recipe for blueberry zucchini bread, visit wagrone.com. Washington farmers never fail to amaze me with their dedication to growing the very best crops and with their generosity in continuing to give back to the communities they live in. That's it for this episode of Washington Grown. We'll see you next time. <laughs>